thank you to the Boston Public Library for lending us this incredibly beautiful space for this conversation today. We are so thrilled to be here and we are so thrilled to be joined by many folks from city, um, city departments and agencies, both up here on the panel and in the audience. Um, we are, of course, joined by our wonderful mayor, Michelle Wu. We will also be hearing from Dr. Paul Watanabe, and then we will be having a panel conversation with the four wonderful folks up here. Uh, we have received some questions in the form of um, uh, online submissions for those of you who RSVP'd, and if all goes according to plan, we will try and save some time at the end for live audience questions as well. Um, without Further ado, uh, I would like to start by introducing our wonderful mayor, Michelle Wu. <laughs> mayor, thank you so much for being here. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being part of this, and thank you to our incredible panelists. Um, this is, I, I was um, really excited to see this on the calendar because I remember back um, even to my time on the city council, and I was a couple years into being a city councilor at that moment, and kind of looked around and realized that we had not had an official, at that point, Lunar New Year celebration in City Hall ever before. So that was the first year that we did that not too long ago. And now to see our ERG and um, so many staff members and, and um, parts of our workforce and partnerships and community really centering the identities and cultures and communities that our, um, our team brings uh, the intersectionality of those identities, and then to create space to highlight not only the incredible work that you do, but how it layers in with the experiences and um, the identities that we bring to this uh, very challenging moment to be in public service in a lot of ways. So um, you have an incredible panel here representing such a, a wide array of day-to-day -day approaches and kind of angles into the work of serving our residents. Um, so to Ezra and Candace and Connie and Para and Athena, thank you for not only being part of our team, but for being willing to share your experiences today and your leadership. Um, and my job today is to introduce someone who is just an anchor and foundation uh, in the API community here locally, but also known nationally as um, a, a renowned expert and source of wisdom and um, scholarship. Uh, professor Dr. Paul Watanabe is the professor of political science and director of the Institute for Asian American Studies at UMass Boston. Uh, he has served on many, many boards and councils and was appointed by President Obama to be on the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, I have known him for uh, quite some time now and he's been a mentor in um, helping me grow and helping um, our community here think about where we have been. Even, you know, sometimes these conversations can focus very much on the national and um, and international as they should, but to have someone who is so dedicated to ensuring that the stories of our Asian American community right here in Boston over the history that we, ha we bring to the city and have been part of the city um, is, is integrated into all of the work and policy making. It's very special to have Professor Watanabe's um, presence and leadership here in Boston and then to have him here with us today. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. I just uh, returned the last week from uh, going to Oakland and met uh, Michelle Wu's sort of other counterpart on the West Coast, the mayor of Oakland, who has a very similar story to Michelle Wu's, and it's great to see both of them within this period of time. <clears throat> Let me begin by giving my thanks to the city of Boston for this experiment. It seems like a bit of an experiment in having this Asian Pacific Amer American uh, Heritage Month celebration, and I, and I think it should be the beginnings of something that I hope will grow as we begin this uh, program today. And let me 
turn to the first slide and let me show you this first slide. And the reason why I'm showing this first slide is this is a slide that's maybe familiar to all of you. This is the driving of the Golden Spike, the so-called Golden Spike, the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. This took place about 50 miles north of where I grew up in Bingham Canyon, Utah. And this signifies the, the coming together of the trains from the east and the west and the driving of the final Golden Spike that unites the Transcontinental Railroad. This is a picture that's probably in all of your history books you've seen it, and I think GE right now is running a commercial where they show this picture in some respects. But it's interesting, it shows uh, uh, several dozens of people at this point, point celebrating the completion of the Golden Spike. But if you look at this picture as I have with a, with a, with a uh, microscope, the fact of the matter is that there's not a single uh, Chinese person in this picture. And you say, well, why is that important? Well, the reason why it's important is at this moment, which we talk about the, the completion of Transcontinental Railroad, the ma major sort of public uh, involvement in the United States at the time, the completion of this major event, there is not a Chinese person because the Chinese person in this picture should be there because they're the ones who actually built the railroad particularly in the most difficult part from going from west to east. Over 80% of the labor, the people who actually built the railroad, not the Leland Stanfords who financed it and so forth, those are names that are famous to us, but the people who actually built the railroad are Chinese laborers, and there's not a single one in this picture. They're, they're invisible. They're not in this picture. They're, they're, they're devoid of the history of the, of the Asian American experience in the United States. Let me show you another slide. The next slide is a book by Oscar Hanlon. It's called The Uprooted, and it's the epic story of the great migrations that made the American people. And in this epic account, as you see, it won the Pulitzer Prize in 1951. And it still is, by many people, a standard American uh, uh, book used to talk about the immigration story in the United States of America. But if you look at this epic account, there's not a single word about people who did, came across, not across the Atlantic, and, and figuratively went to uh, the, the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. Not a single word about anybody who came across the other ocean, across the Pacific, and came across that, that expanse to help be part of this epic account of the great migrations that made the American people. Not a single word about people who came across from Asia, in other words, and it's all about the immigration from uh, Europe to the United States. And in, even in subsequent editions of this book, there's very seldom been any sort of mention of the immigration that came across either from the southern border or across the Pacific to the United States. In other words, are invisible from this story. And the next account. And some ways to correct this is when Ron Takaki, a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, said, we're going to have to correct this story. We're going to have to talk about that other migration that went across the Pacific and went to Angel Island in San Francisco. And that's why Ron Tukaki wrote this book called Strangers from a Different Shore. It talks about the immigration of the people from Asia who came to the United States. And he, he attempted to correct the record in this regard to talk about and to make us less invisible in terms of telling the story of the American people. And let me tell you another story about Boston. Uh, there's a story, for example, about various people in Boston is trying to protect Chinatown. And traditionally, over the years, the decades, there have been an effort by people to protect Chinatown from, from institutional expansion, from highways, from large institutional uh, builders, and so forth. And there's a small group of individuals who've been fought this fight for many years. And there's a great story that's told in Michael Liu's great book, Forever Struggle, which I suggest you all read. It's about Chinatown, but it's really about the struggle by people in the city of Boston to maintain their agency and place within the city. And he talks about a small group of individuals who took the head of the BRA, Stephen Coyle, a few years ago and did a walk around in, in Chinatown and just wanted to show him what the neighborhood was like. And at some point, Stephen Coyle, there's a kid riding one of these big wheels, a little kid about three or four years old riding a big wheel on, this, on the sidewalk. And Stephen Coyle stops and he says, what's that kid doing here? And the people who are walking around Chinatown says, well, Mr. Coyle, he lives here. And the reason is when you're a little kid and you live in the city and that's what you do, you, you, you play on the parking lots and on the sidewalks. And the point is, is that Stephen Coyle looked at Chinatown and he only saw the things at the, at the base level. He saw the restaurants and he saw the stores, but he didn't see the people that lived behind him. He didn't see it as a neighborhood where kids grew up and people actually lived. They were invisible to him and that invisibility is something that helps explain in some respects the historical neglect of Chinatown as a neighborhood where people live, where you can put the combat zone, for example, and move all these other large institutional expansion into this neighborhood where people live. It was invisible to them. 
So despite all of the, the, this, uh, Asian Americans still remain strangers to many invisible. They are less known about the history, experience, and condition of Asian Americans than any major racial group in the United States. A recent survey showed that nearly 30% of Asian of Americans uh, in general could not name a single prominent Asian American person, the, even given the fact that the Vice President of the United States is an Asian American descent. We are strangers despite the fact we've been in the United States for over 200 years, and despite the fact that today there are almost 24 million people alone or in combination in the United States. In Massachusetts, there are about 582,000 Asian Americans. In, in, in whole or in part Asian American, we represent about a little more than 8% of the population of Massachusetts. In the city of Boston, there are about 85,000 Asian Americans, and we represent about 12.6% of the population of the city of Boston. So we're growing. Indeed, the fastest growing population in Massachusetts in racial group is Asian Americans in Massachusetts and in the nation. And it's fed largely by immigration. In fact, soon the United in the United States, Asian Americans will be the largest immigrant group in the United States, much more than Latinos, for example, which gets a lot of the attention. You'd think if the discussion is taking place in the United States that the Latino population was the largest immigrant population, but it will soon be the, the Asian American population. There's great diversity in this, in this uh, growth as well. Nearly 20 Asian ethnic groups are in Massachusetts, with more than 1,000 in Massachusetts from the traditional places like China, India, Vietnam, but also Nepal, Burma, Bhutan. And there thus is a need for disaggregated data. There is no such thing as sort of an average Asian American in Massachusetts. And if you do so, you hide this diversity. There's great socioeconomic diversity and complexity as well, and income, educational attainment, poverty rates, et cetera. Asian Americans tend to be bimodal in their distribution. Many of the groups, like the Chinese American population, they tend to be amongst the lowest in terms of income and so forth, some of the highest in terms of educational attainment and so forth. But you cannot really capture the sense of Asian Americans by any, aggregate, by any disaggregated data, by any average. Averages hide all the dif distinctions, and that's why we need to have disaggregated data to understand what's happening with our Asian American community. The different situation, for example, about Cambodian Americans who in Massachusetts represent about the lowest level of educational attainment of any group in Massachusetts amongst those who are at the other end of the scale, those who are South Asian uh, and, and Korean and, and other populations who represent some of the highest levels of educational attainment. No single category can capture all of this. And what are the consequences of this invisibility and this erasure in terms of American experience? When history and experience is seen through a narrow lens, it often leads to marginalization, prejudice, vulnerability, stereotypes, and racializations is what we call it. And Asian Americans have uniquely been sort of racialized in two distinct ways, as a model minority and as, per 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 as perpetual foreigners. I'm not going to talk about the model minority element, but it's really a model minority element that's been utilized against not Asian Americans particularly, but against blacks and other communities in the United States. It's less about the valorization of Asian Americans, much more using it as a weapon against other uh, groups in the United States. But let me talk about the perpetual foreigner notion, the, di the idea of what Angela and Chetta calls outsider racialization. It's first to exclude and now to discipline Asian Americans. The idea of perpetual foreigners is one that's really used to discipline not blacks and others, but to Asian Americans in the United States. It's to tell Americans that no matter, Asian Americans, no matter how long you have been here, and some Asian Americans have been here for generation upon generation, that in some ways you don't belong, that in some ways you don't, you're, you're strangers to our society and you should remain so, and you don't, you're really from somewhere else in the United States. It's reflected, for example, in the next slide we'll show this. In the 1998 Nagano Olympics, where uh, in the Olympic Games, the number one sort of event that everybody watches is the women's figure skating. It's the number one event that is featured on the Olympic broadcast. 1998, the issue was who was going to win the women's uh, figure skating camp championship, Tara Lipinski or Michelle Kwan, and that was the battle. And this is how the, one of the stations announced with a, tr a little crawl across the screen who won the, uh, the 1998 women's uh, figure skating standards. It says, American beats Kwan. It meant that Tara Lipinski beat Michelle Kwan, but Kwan, of course, was not, a, not, not American. She was an American as, as Tara Lipinski was. She was raised and born in Walnut Creek, California, never been in China in her life before this. 
and yet she was considered not the American, that the American was Tara Lipinski, who beat Michelle Kwan. The historical manifestations are many aliens ineligible for citizenship, Asian Americans exclusively until, until for example, my, my group, which is Japanese Americans until the 1950s, were not allowed, even if you're an immigrant to the United States, to become a citizen of the United States. This is a fundamental basis of American society, that you come from all over the world to come here to the United States and able to establish yourself and become citizens of the United States. This is a, 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 a position denied Asian immigrants to the United States for many, many centuries, and uniquely so. We are also placed in a position of exclusion, as we know, in 1882, for the first time in the history of the United States of America, we told a group of people, people of Chinese descent and, and people from China, that you cannot come to the United States of America. This is the first time in the history of our country we did this for any group. And it's a, it's a creation of the notion of the illegal or undocumented immigrant was created in 1882 when we did this for the first time for a population. The Asian American population soon followed in terms of exclusion extent, ultimately extended to all Asian Americans after 1924. So all immigrants from Asia could not come to the United States after 1924. Uh, it led to the, the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II, like my family was. Uh, my family was sent to uh, Thule, uh, Manzanar and later to Thule Lake uh, concentration camps. I just took my students to Manzanar. I, I teach a class on, the, on research on Asian Americans and the internment of Japanese Americans. And we visited Manzanar recently, and we do, I take them there to little Tokyo in Japan to see what the path was of those like my family who went from living in Los Angeles as farmers in, in 1942 to being taken to incarceration camps in Manzanar. And we know it as terms of the Vincent Chin case in 1983 and Wen Ho Lee and South Asians after 9-11 and the COVID-19 response to COVID-19 and Atlanta murders in Manorey Park. All these are historical manifestations of the notion that Asian Americans are perpetual foreigners. Even in the Boston mayoral race, one city council candidate state posed a photo of Michelle Wu, our mayor, a daughter of, of, of Taiwanese immigrants, alongside the China's, and it showed her alongside China's leader uh, uh, Xi Jinping, asking, "Are we about to elect a Chinese citizen to control the city of Boston? Does China run Boston, Mayor Wuhan?" These sorts of attacks against our mayor are reflective of the fact that nobody is protected from these sorts of attacks. And she, I think, almost David must pick up something where someone makes an attack about the fact that she is of Asian descent and questioning her loyalty to the United States of America. Why is this outsider racialization so pernicious? Because it combines race with nativity. In 1882, the Chinese reached their peak level of immigration to the United States. They say in 1882, maybe it's re reasonable. We have too many immigrants coming to the United States. This is a debate we have now today about trying to limit immigration. And maybe it's true, we had 39,000 Chinese come in 1882 and perhaps or the country couldn't take any more immigrants. But the country to which more Americans can trace their ancestry to any other is what country, anybody know? It's Germany. Germany is a country to which more Americans trace their ancestry to any other. And I looked up in the, in the, in the historical books and I saw that 1882 was also the peak year of German immigration to the United States. And in that year, there were 250,620 Germans immigrated to the United States, and yet there was no exclusion of Germans. We had 39,000 Chinese, 250,000 Germans, but we had the Chinese Exclusion Acts and not the German Exclusion Acts of 1882. Indeed, there was total exclusion, as I indicated, by 1924. The Chinese, it was not just their numbers, it was, their, it was not just the quantity, it was the complexion, it was the component that they were Chinese that was the critical factor, it was their race that was the critical factor. In summary, historically, a systematic and deliberate drive for exclusion, legally, socially, politically, denial of right to immigrate to the United States, denial of right to naturalize, denial of civil and political rights, segregated school, denial of the right to own land, etc. The removal of Japanese Americans, incarceration, and the go back to where you belong, a message of exclusion, faces our students today in the Boston schools and other areas. This notion of go back to where you belong, whether uttered by the President of the United States or a classmate in a Boston school, is clearly a message that you don't belong here in the United States. There's trauma associated with this as well. What are the responses to this situation? Well, I'll show you the next slide. 
part of the responses to this is to do what Corky Lee, who's a re 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 recently passed away, he's a leader of our, our community in terms of chronicling the, the, the story of Asian Americans. And Corky Lee took this picture and he insisted on taking this picture a few years ago. This is the same scene, but instead of having, uh, not having Asian Americans, he had Chinese Americans, many of them who are descendants of people who actually built the railroad, participate in this, and he took over the space. At the, and he said that we're going to have only Chinese Americans in this space. And he took this agency and he said we're no longer going to be invisible. And this was his way of contesting the invisibility. And there are other ways to do so as well. It's, part of it is to, to celebrate as we are here and remember and to honor our history, culture, and experience. Visibility, awareness, and identity are linked to self-esteem and pride. Thus, for those of us who are Asian Pacific Americans, there is need to celebrate our achievements as we often do during this month and to remind ourselves of the work still ahead. What is the unfinished work of the Asian Americans and for all of us? After 120 years ago, W.E. Du Bois said the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. This is true in 2023 as well. As we approach minority non-white status of the United States in 2043, how will we respond? The color line has sadly been reaffirmed time and again from Minneapolis to Atlanta to Kenosha to Charleston to Charlottesville to Buffalo to, to Monterey Park. What Martin Luther King called the shameful condition of America is on display. Racial hierarchies remain, inequities persist. In terms of the COVID pandemic, a Asian Americans have been blamed and bullied for the China virus led by President of the United States, uh, and we have become the face of the, and, and any sort of problem requires a face, and the face that we put on the COVID crisis is an Asian face. But even worse, we have been beaten and shot with high-powered weapons, slashed with knives, had chemicals poured on us, and no day goes by without another report of an elderly person attacked and a youngster bullied. Fear and trauma to leave their homes and go to schools indeed is the greatest fear of Asian Americans in the United States. Think about that. A survey by Stop AAPI Hate of Americans during the COVID crisis asked Americans what their greatest fear was and their threat to their, their well-being in the United States. And overwhelmingly, everybody in the United States, all groups in the United States except Asian Americans said getting COVID-19 was their greatest fear. For Asian Americans, their greatest fear was not getting COVID-19. It was the fear of being harassed and, and subjected to violence by their fellow Americans. That was a greater fear than getting COVID-19 itself. So think about that sort of level of trauma that's taking place in, within our communities. Uh, think of the impact on behavioral health, on substance abuse. I just saw a report come out that said that Asian Americans, in terms of substance abuse, the increase has been greater than any other population in the United States during the COVID crisis. There's been an increase in levels of substance abuse in all populations, but Asian Americans have shown the greatest level of increases in substance abuse. In a, sense, in a survey recently put out by Taft, the Asian American Foundation, found that only 22% of Asian Americans say that they feel accepted and belong in the United States. It's the lowest level of any group in the United States. Only 22% of Asian Americans say that they feel like they accepted and belong in the United States. And the Boston School study done recently by uh, Tung and, and Sasaki tells the same story about the sense in which Boston, in Boston public schools Asian-American students feel the least accepted and have the sense of belonging is the smallest of any group. So my, my final question is, is that uh, what, is a, what are the other responses? Well, education is one of the responses. We must have role models and mentors. Ethnic studies and racial and ethnic institutes resist calls to ignore and not allow our community to confront the damaging and critical role of systemic racism. This knowledge and exposure is necessary for any hope of change. And the Boston schools, thank God, are, are, are attempting to be leaders in this regard. Sorry. Sorry about that. And uh, sorry, that's from one of your Boston school teachers. Uh, it is truly. Uh, and education is critical to this role, and we do have to do it correctly. As we're do and, and a lot of states are not doing it correctly. We're mandating ethnic studies. We're mandating that they teach uh, uh, Asian American studies without proper preparation and training and so forth. And I think the Boston schools are doing it the, absolutely the correct way. I was even told recently that, the, that Florida, of all places, is actually mandating the teaching of ethnic studies in their schools for all four communities of government. 
racial groups. And I questioned them. And I said, how is that going to get by a DeSantis veto? And they said, it's, it's created as veto-proof legislation, so DeSantis couldn't veto it. But I said, what if you did a, a, a question about the prominent Asian Americans like George Takei or Helen Zia, for example? George Takei should be a name that's familiar to you, right? He's probably the, the, one of the best known Asian Americans today, and he's an activist around issues of internment. So you can talk about George Takei, but when you talk about him as a whole person, you say, what's his activism about? It's about gay activism, right? He's a gay person, as is Helen Zia. So what do you do? Stop the conversation in Florida and say, we can't talk about that aspect of their background when we talk about it. Talking about ethnic studies is talking about the intersectionality of issues involving gender and race and all these other issues combined. You've got to talk about the whole person when you talk about ethnic studies and all these elements. And in Florida, I can see you having trying to talk about ethnic studies and talk about the role of Helen Zia, who's a principal factor and, a, and an activist and has been to be a lesbian in her, in her case. And you stop the conversation when you talk about the aspects of what their sexual... sexual background are about. Uh, let me end this by saying Asian Americans have important roles to play in, confirm, in contributing to the racial divide, in, in confronting the racial divides, and another responsibility is our solidarity. To our Latino brothers and sisters, we Asian Americans can say we have, have been the undesirable strangers at the border, first to be excluded in 1882. We have been considered outsiders, valued for our ability to pick fruits and vegetables or to hit baseballs at times, and often little else. To the undocumented, we know the term illegal immigrants was first coined for us. Paper sons, my father was an illegal immigrant. Over one million Asian Americans out of status today targeted for deportation like many Cambodian and, 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 and South Vietnamese and Vietnamese uh, immigrants to the United States. To our Muslim and Arab brothers and sisters, we know we have been considered a yellow peril. We have been considered agents of foreign influence, collective guilt, like my family, we are thrown into America's concentration camps for looking like the enemy. To our Jewish community, I, I know because of my career as a professor began soon after. The first time I ever appeared in a newspaper in Boston was with a picture of a swastika that had been placed on my door as a young professor. And, 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 and someone took sort of question, I don't even know to this day why it was put there, but there's some question, I, so, uh, there had been some activity against some uh, Jewish uh, synagogues in the area, and I had certainly made some comment perhaps in the hallway about it. sorry, about, about that, and perhaps, and I think also about people like Susito, a, a Japanese-American who fought in World War II in Europe at the time, think about that, a Japanese-American whose family was in a concentration camp in the U.S., who fought for the United States during World War II, he was a Japanese-American. And yet, while his family was in a concentration camp in the U.S., he was one of the people who liberated the, the concentration camp in Dachau. He's an individual who participated in the liberation of those camps, and his family was, while his family was in a concentration camp back in the United States. To our black brothers and sisters, I want to say this. I want to go back to Ferguson, Missouri, a place called Ferguson, Missouri, where a few years ago, many residents and members of the police department wore badges badge said, I am Darnell Wilson. Darnell Wilson was a young man who shot a, young, a younger person, an 18-year-old kid named Michael Brown, on the streets of, of Ferguson, Missouri, a few years ago. And the death of Michael Brown was the initial salvo in the so-called Black Lives Movement, which, which has become much more general today. To our black brothers and sisters, indeed for all of us, the beginning of understanding and the hope of educating, of eradicating persistent Racism and debilitating inequities is when all of us, yellow, black, red, brown, and white, can proclaim in solidarity, I am Michael Brown, I am George Floyd, I am Trayvon Martin, I am Vincent Chin, I am Rihanna Taylor, I am Ahmed Arbery, I am Suncha Kim, I am, I am not an illegal, I am not an other, I am not a terrorist, I am not a virus, we are all somebody. That's the solidarity that we need to confront these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Watanabe. Thank you so much to our speakers, Mayor Michelle Wu. Um, thank you, thank you all. Um, we're gonna get started with our panel now. Um, again, my name is Ezra Bailey Wong. I'm the Director of Speech Writing for Mayor Michelle Wu. We are joined here today um, by Candace Wynn, Community Relations Specialist for the Mayor's Office of LGBTQ Plus Advancement. 
We have Connie Wong, Deputy Commissioner for Labor Relations, Human Resources, and Legal Affairs at the Boston Fire Department. Para Jayasinghar, City Engineer for the Public Works Department. And Athena Arasu, Senior Financial Analyst at Boston Public Schools. Thank you all so much for being here today. We're going to start by saying that in putting together this event, we really wanted to be intentional about representing a broad diversity of identities and experiences within the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. One of the ways in which that is true of this panel, the folks that are up here, is in terms of age and experience working at the city of Boston. So I wanted to ask all of you, in the time that you've been working for the city, how have you seen Boston evolve? Do you want to go across the line or out our age and go by age? <laughs> Para, you want to kick it off? I'll follow you. Thank you, Isra. So I've had the pleasure of serving the city for almost a quarter of a century back in nine, late 1990s. When we ask how has the city changed, let's start with the administration. Uh, I am in public works, we deal with the community and I've always decided that my staff or the administration look like the city we are serving. And that may not have always been the case back in the late 1990s. I'm happy to say that we have evolved ever so slightly, ever so it's better now than those days. So that's the administration. Even our city has evolved over the time. There's more of a, a more cosmopolitan society that is there. So those are my reflections about how we have evolved. Connie? I would agree with that. Um, I started my career with the city of Boston after graduating from law school in the mid-90s. And I have to say that every time I was assigned to represent a department or I walked into a meeting, I didn't see anyone that looked like me. And there were very few AAPI employees with the city of Boston, or if they were, they were usually either in IT or some sort of accounting type of role. Um, I left in early 2000 and didn't return until my present position in 2014. And over that time, I actually saw an increase in AAPI employees, which I was very gratified to see. But I think more importantly, over the last eight years, I started to see more and more AAPI employees in significant roles, uh, whether it's department heads or managers or given awesome um, responsibilities. And so I think that that's a reflection of the community, but also a reflection of our society, how we're trying to evolve. And I think that the last several mayors have been very intentional about that. And so we have seen that reflection slowly, but slowly, but surely, um, it'll reflect more of all the communities that we serve. Um, and for me, growing up, um, there were not a lot of positive words in Vietnamese to describe anyone who was queer. And so the word that we had was mede, which derives from pedophilia. And this is a common theme that happens when a trans or queer person is looking to change their name legally. So they have to stand in front of a judge and get their name publicized in the newspaper. And for anyone to decide to protest that name change, it goes in lines with why people use bede or pedophilia to associate themselves with queer folks. And so with the gender ordinance that passed in 2020, we've learned that languages matter and languages can change. So I've learned recently that the word for trans in Vietnamese is ngu chung zai, which directly translates to person crossing worlds, which is a better definition than what we said earlier. And we are working with MOLA, with Do It, and with the registry to change how we ask people about gender and, and their sex on city forms, documents, um, and removing the male and female option on marriage licenses as well. And MOLA also has an LGBTQ um, competency training available for all city hall employees so that they can learn more about the importance of pronouns and gender identity and how to be an ally for queer folks, um, especially as Pride Month is um, approaching. I feel like I'm on the newer side of the spectrum here. So I started uh, working for BPS in the city of Boston in 2020. Um, I was fully remote at the time. It was definitely pandemic mode. And so since then, I feel like we are reawakening and reconnecting 
um, you know, we're shifting from that emergency management mode at all times to now being able to set the groundwork for more longer term thinking and like systems change that has been needed for a long time. So one example that I'd point to in BPS is that through the pandemic, there was a push to get social workers and family liaisons hired at every school, right? And that was the baseline support. And now that that's been established, the focus is now shifting on the specific supports that not only those staff can provide, but you know, across the district, how are we looking at things like language access and making sure that, okay, you have a family liaison, is that actually working for the communities at a particular school, you know, shifting to that lens now that we can see the horizon a little bit and start to think um, beyond just the next six months or the next year. And that's the shift that I see. Amazing, thank you all. Dr. Watanabe talked about the importance of building solidarity with other communities in this moment of intersectionality. I'm curious to hear how you all think about building relationships either between our own communities or with other communities of color. I'll tackle it first then. I think it's very important no matter what you do, whether it's professionally or personally, all communities need to work with one another. And I go back to um, a phrase I use often, because outside of here, I coach a Chinese lion and dragon dance. Dragon dance is really more of a sport. And everyone's tethered together holding poles, and you're all connected together, trying to make shapes and figures and run and jump. And I often say, we as a team, we are only as strong as our weakest link. And I think that that translates very well to building relationships, because no one can improve upon all that's needed to uh, improve society unless we work together. And another phrase also comes to mind that I know a lot of politicians use, and that's, I actually had to write it down, a rising tide lifts all boats. So if we don't work together, we'll never achieve what's possible. So I think that it's within communities, but across communities. So whenever I hear this phrase, bridging the gap, as a bridge builder for the city, it always <laughs> kind of resonates with me. But it is in the core of, it's almost like in our DNA, where if we understand that together we are much stronger and we can achieve better results. So for me, it's almost fundamental if we can see who the person is rather than judging the book by its cover. So. Yeah, I'd say, Building connections between communities is really important to me and also very personal because while I am Native Hawaiian, I also, my family heritage spans a lot of different communities and, and my family from Malaysia is South Asian and my family in Hawaii is also Japanese and Chinese and German. And so that sense of like wanting to connect across cultures is, is personal, but it's also an opportunity and I think the way I see this playing out um, through my work and through public service is, first of all, by staying open um, and staying curious. So not necessarily pushy, right? I'm not asking people about their heritage all the time because that's also aggressive. <laughs> but if someone is willing to share, creating the space and opportunity for connection, for cultural sharing, um, and I think that allows people to connect over related experiences, even across Asian communities, across specific communities, and, and beyond that as well, right? Like there's a lot of things that I can connect with someone on when they're willing to open up and share. Um, and on a broader scale, I really think that embracing diversity as a strength is the goal, right? So as an organization, we say that a lot, like we want diversity, but in reality, are we embracing it as a strength and not seeing it as a hurdle or something to overcome, right? So. In BPS, we have an extremely diverse district, both in um, language and culture and ability and, and all of these things that our students bring. And when we start talking about that as something where we have to spend more or put resources towards it, right, to, to, to help our students learn, but rather we should be embracing students as a whole. And, and I, I see that as, as a city when we see all of these different things that people bring and how we can create opportunities and spaces for people to connect, um, that's where I think people can then start to thrive. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. And I think that really ties in a lot to some of the remarks that Dr. Watanabe gave about, you know, it's impossible to have a meaningful, substantive conversation about any of these issues unless we, we tackle the whole, unless we're addressing the whole person, every aspect of the identities. Um, and so because there are so many different issues that touch the different intersecting identities that exist within the diaspora of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander folks. I'm curious to hear from all of you if there were to be one overarching movement or cause within the AANHPI community today, and you were given the power to set that agenda and decide what that cause would be, what would you choose and why? I'll take a crack. <laughs> one word. Sorry. One word, integration. What do I mean by that? There's so much to celebrate amongst all of us, amongst all of you. Your cultural heritage and what that means. Singapore is a rather interesting country where they, through the government, they go to great lengths to celebrate those cultural nuances, those cultural dif differences. And they don't see it as a difference. It is how we celebrate each other's cultural heritages. And if we can do that more so that we feel easier amongst us, maybe we can break down some of those moments of awkwardness. So that's what I would try to do. Um, I guess when I think about this question, I think about the identities I hold. I am Vietnamese, I am trans, I'm a woman. And there have been many times where I am in Vietnamese spaces and I'm either the only queer person or vice versa. In queer spaces, I'm the only Asian person. and. Um, I've only been with City Hall um, for five months, but as City of Boston, I grew up here and I've been in many different uh, nonprofit organizations. Currently, there's no active organizations that really serves queer Asian folks. And so I think there's not necessarily one agenda. I would say, I think I would say a, a bunch, um, but just like reminding folks that like silence, like, normalizes but also allows the terror that happens to black and brown folks and that when thinking about how we can support communities, thinking about how we can center queer folks while thinking of trans people's safety and the sense of belonging that's often occupied by their mental health or a fear of being targeted, thinking about ending um, trans misogyny, but also using gender inclusive languages, just even announcing your pronouns um, is just a safe way uh, for folks to, in the room to feel included, um, but yeah. Um, yeah, so as much as I want to say there's one thing, right, I also think as an extremely diverse and multifaceted community, it's really hard to just hone in on that. And I do appreciate the greater understanding now of a separation between Asian American identity and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, right? It helps when you call that out to show that these are very different communities and it makes you think like, is this event actually, is, when you say it's an AAPI event, is there a PI element to it or is it just an Asian American event? And that's fine, right? But let's be intentional about that. And so I guess coming from the um, Native Hawaiian perspective, and I, it's hard, I can't speak for all Native Hawaiians, I can't speak for all Pacific Islanders, but definitely um, decolonization is super important, right? You have these different frameworks where on the Native side, identity is based on connection to land specifically, right? Where it's um, a group of people and their origin story is literally tied to a particular land area. And so in terms of the struggle and the fight, it's about decolonization, it's about um, caring for our land, and that is often at odds with, on the Asian American side, you know, a fight for citizenship and for equal rights and more of the civil rights framework, right? So you can see how those two things are often at odds with each other. Um, so it, it's something to acknowledge, and I think there's still, you know, we were chatting about this before, but strength in numbers, and, and it helps to have a broader, bigger tent and representation um, but we have to also recognize that there's different layers and levels to that. And for Pacific Islander folks, um, it's also really hard to feel represented this far away from home, right? Um, but it helps when you create the space and the opportunity to talk about it. Yeah. 
And I'll just briefly add a little bit to it, because I think the moderator wants us to move on soon. But for me, uh, there are just so many different things we can do. But for me, it comes down to wanting to empower other AAPI, um, younger generation or any AAPI, AANIPI folks, to believe in the possibilities. And that comes with visibility. Um, you need to be proud of who you are. For my parents' generation, not my parents, thankfully, because they tried to encourage me to do all sorts of things, but a lot of Asian American parents of um, my parents' generation told the kids, don't make waves, just study hard, work hard, keep your head down, don't make trouble. If you do that, then you're forever going to be invisible. So I think we need to make a little more noise and be a little more assertive. And that comes in part from being proud of who you are. Uh, I'm as American as anyone else. I'm a lifelong Bostonian, I grew up here. But the countless number of times I've been asked, where do you come from? I say Boston. Um, it's being proud of who you are so that you can encourage everybody else to see the possibilities of what's out there. And I think as a city, as a government entity, we've made strides, we have a long way to go, but if there's more people that look like us in all different sorts of positions, whether it's high level or low level, it'll encourage others to apply or to become that next person. I'll give you an example. When I first came back to the Boston Fire Department, I can count on one hand the number of AAPI firefighters. Because of all sorts of recruitment and civil service laws, the numbers are still low, but I have managed to increase that for more than fourfold in my seven plus years on the fire department. And so I think that that, for me personally, is a proud accomplishment. I just need everyone's help to help me increase that a hundredfold. Thank you. And I think such an important point, um, what you shared there about not just the importance of folks being proud of who they are, but also at the systemic level. And for those of us who have the ability to influence systems, to build structures and platforms that empower and create space and opportunity for people to be able to be proud, to show up so that the onus is not on the individual, but exists at the macro level and that the things that we are building lend themselves to the opportunity for individuals to be able to show up in those ways. So thank you all for sharing. Um, the next question, we're gonna turn now to some Q&A that we received from folks who RSVP'd. Um, Athena, your answer really, I think, covered a lot of this, but if there's anything that, that folks wanna add to it, we received a question about the term Asian American and how it has been helpful historically in uniting our communities, but also acknowledging that it has obscured some of the unique challenges that communities within the broader Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander diaspora those challenges that they face. So why is it so important that we disaggregate data and experiences to address inequality within our own communities? And for additional context here, um, the widest gap in economic outcomes and financial stability of any racial group in this country exists between Asian Americans. So I'm Taiwanese American, for example, and only 1.6% of us receive SNAP benefits or food stamps. Meanwhile, within the Burmese American community, that is 60%. So that's 1.6% versus 60%. And then Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, for example, their home ownership rates are tied with black Americans for being the lowest in the country. And so these are serious disparities. Anybody want to tackle it? <laughs> Power is at least honest. Um, I see both sides of the argument. Um, if you want to talk about Asian Americans broadly, we're only about 9% of the U.S. population. So there is something to the argument of we need to stick together in order to have that political power, economic power, or that visibility. But I also see the other side. Um, the Asian American population in the United States were so vi wide and varied that one size does not fit all. And so in order to, going back to the rising tide lifts all boats, we have to help one another. And if we're all lumped together, then those that truly need our help will never figure into the policy makers thinking. And so disaggregating the data could be very, very useful. So I, 
in my mind, what it really comes down to is we need to stick together and celebrate our differences, but help one another so that we can grow and have that visibility and have that voice and advocate for all communities, not just those on the lower end of the spectrum. Thank you, yeah. Um, we received another question here, actually, Connie, that I think you've already touched upon um, regarding how the, minor the model minority myth impacts how you navigate professional spaces, conversations, and relationships, and how it plays a role in how you intentionally advance racial justice and equity where you have power and privilege. Does anyone else on the panel want to talk about sort of your interaction or relationship with the model minority myth and how it's impacted your professional experiences? Yes, sort of being aware of the fact that someone else can see you or what you do from that, from that lens helps us to understand how to navigate that. And the other thought is, you know, irrespective, we still find the best person for a given task, but when that person is picked, we can always sort of understand sort of a background bias as to why that person may have been picked. So this is a conscious effort which at least I try to, when I try to build my teams, to ensure that there's the honor in the work that they do, the credibility with, in the selection process, and that individual integrity. So hopefully we can make those changes. Thank you. Athena? Yeah, I really appreciate um, that Dr. Watanabe referred to the model minority myth as a weapon that's, you, you know, wielded not solely against the Asian community, but against a lot of other communities of color. And I think when we're talking about equity, that's really important to think about because I think this myth is a hurdle towards equity. It's something that points communities against each other. Um, but when our goal is to provide the resources and opportunities for everyone to thrive, then that shifts the narrative, right? And it's like, well, if we're focusing on something like language access, that's gonna benefit a lot of our Asian communities, but that's also gonna benefit our, um, you know, our Haitian Creole communities, our Cabo Verdean communities. And so when you're trying to target resources and, and provide support, um, I, I think this, this myth is really harmful towards that narrative, yeah. Thank you so much. And we have one minute remaining of official time. Obviously, I don't, I don't know if we have the ability to stay a little bit longer if folks want to, but I personally will not be kicking anyone out. Um, so at this point, we'd love to turn it over for, for live audience questions. If anyone here has, has a question that they would like to ask anyone on this panel. If not, we can also wrap up on time, unless also, um, Anyone on the panel wants to? Sam, you've got a question? Hey. Oh, I just, okay. Well, the chief told me to stand up, so I have to stand up. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sam Hyun. I'm uh, the Director of Federal Relations for the City of Boston. Um, I think, first and foremost, you know, this, this entire panel uh, encapsulated, I think, everything that we had hoped um, it would be. It's, it was honest, it was vulnerable, it was rich in. And nuance um, and tackled questions and 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 issues that I think are critical to not just the current or present but the future of how we build Boston. Um, I think you know want to thank the professor um, for incredible knowledge that I think I would highly doubt actually that most people knew, um, including those within our own community, and is so critical to know. That being said, it was, it was a lot of heaviness. Um, and so on a, on a note that I think, I feel like is in line with uh, the mayor's hope and dreams for the city and for why I think why all of you are here, what is your greatest hope for our community going forward in the city of Boston? What does that look like? Um, it doesn't have to be overly ambitious. It can be something simple, but uh, what is your hope and dream for our community and the city of Boston? Thank you, Sam. In seven years, Boston's going to celebrate its 400th birthday. And many people might see the roots of that 400th birthday just from one tiny lens as to who may have been here first or from that lens. Hopefully we can celebrate our 400th birthday in the most unified, inclusive, and celebrating the rich history 
and the rich present composition of Boston. That's what I'm hoping for. I would echo that. I like the unity part, and what I was thinking is there's been so much chatter, so much divisiveness over the last however many years. The pandemic certainly didn't help everyone, no matter where you're from, in terms of human relations and human interactions, because we all had to social distance. But I think if we all sat down and truly talked, but more importantly, listen to each other, we'll find that we all have more in common than we have differences. And I think if we can begin to do that, um, I think that there is great hope for this country. Um, early on in my onboarding process, uh, my City of Boston email actually used uh, my legal name, which I sometimes refer as my dead name. And dead naming is a, an act when someone intentionally or not refers to a person who's transgender by the name that they used before they transitioned. Um, and quickly, uh, Do It was able to help fix that. And I think being able to make those corrections and um, seeing that a person going through HR, getting dead name, is also the same experience as a person or a constituent coming in to pay for their parking ticket, right? Both experiences are very equal and very real. And so it's important to Again, make those corrections so that the next person coming in City Hall feels safe, feels affirmed, um, whether they're a worker or for whether they're a constituent. And this is not like a queer specific issue, right? Like uh, we've known like some uh, names from, some names may be hard to pronounce, right? And so we want to make sure that all that is corrected or all that is included so that people can feel like they belong here and feel like this city is an inclusive city for all. Yeah, similarly, I hope people feel safe, feel welcomed, and feel like they can thrive in the city. Thank you all. Any other last questions? If not, I wanna thank all of our incredible panelists. Thank you so much for being here, for sharing with us. And thank you to everyone for showing up. Thank you for being here. That's a critical part of the conversation. We can't have it if it's one-sided, if we're shouting into the void. So thank you for listening. Thank you for participating. Have a wonderful, exciting, joyful, safe Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander month. Uh, thank you so much to the cable office. Huge shout out to Dave Burt and his team for live streaming this event. Thank you to the Boston Public Library. Thank you, Dr. Watanabe, for sharing your wealth of information, wisdom, resources, knowledge with us. And have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you.